So I bagged out a month so I wouldn't have to do the writing exercise. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So, <coughs> as you know, this is the disability at the intersections conversation. And apparently there's a little bit of confusion because there's the one about having babies that's around here somewhere too. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> if Very you're just trying to talk about your babies and how to support them, it's like it's down that way somewhere. Very different conversation. So I guess we should just start by introducing ourselves briefly. Since we don't have a lot of time, we're going to try to get you all out of here by 120, 122 at the latest, so you can run, sprint, roll, whatever you're going to do to your next skill building workshop. So uh, my name is uh, Christine Bruno. And I wear a bunch of hats, but primarily for our purposes at TCG at this conference. Uh, I am disability advocate at a nonprofit arts, arts advocacy organization based in New York City, but we're a national nonprofit called Inclusion in the Arts. And, and I'm also an actor. Fantastic. I'm Kate Langsdorf. Um, I'm the Education Programs Manager at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., though uh, for the capacity of today in this conference, I'm here as Arts Administrator who uses a cane. Um, and uh, I also wear a lot of hats, fewer hats, now that I'm a uh, cane walker. Um, but my education and training is in uh, directing and performance. Just a lot of hopping around, though. So we do that all the time. High five. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Prebor. Uh, I run Hands On in New York City. We're an office service organization that provides uh, access for deaf and disabled audiences in theater. Uh, I'm Claudia Alex, associate producer at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I'm a chair of our diversity and inclusion planning council. I serve on our um, access committee. Um, I'm an artist with a disability, and I make it a priority to hire artists with disabilities. Yay, I like it. So we would love to quickly go around the room. Everybody say your name and what organization you are with. Um, let's start to my right. Sure, I'm Elizabeth. I work at Playhouse Square. Here in Canada. Uh, I'm Flori Siri. I'm with the Manhattan Theater Club. David Stewart. I'm the production manager for Texas Performing Arts. Catherine Rush. I'm a playwright. Claire O'Neill, Magic Theater. Caitlin Bryson, California Repertory. Randy Anderson, stage director and choreographer society. Jennifer Toth, also stage director society. Michael Hardy, Institute of Outdoor Theater. Sarah Huddleston, Magic Theater. Elizabeth Broderson, ACT, San Francisco. Jeffrey Carpenter, Bricklage Production Company, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Don Chang, Lighting Designer. Uh, Clea Shapiro, California Shakespeare Theater, or Cal uh, Tears of Tyler, Cal Shakes. Ben Abbott, uh, Poets Theater in Boston. Michael Jones, Crossroads Theater Company. Alyssa Moore, Theater Communications Group. Joel York from New Brown. Mm -hmm. Carol Lover, Allison Zipper. Aaron Williams, TCP. Ryan Haddad, performer and playwright. Uh, Bridget Lee, freelance director. Tallery McRae, Access and Inclusion Consultant. Awesome. Uh, we just introduced ourselves. Oh, 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 I missed everyone. <laughs> Your Hi. name and organization. Uh, I'm Nigel Smith. I'm the artistic director of the Flea Theater. Awesome. Okay. Looks like we got some other people coming in too. We'll, we'll, we'll catch people as we go. Welcome. Hi guys. Welcome. We might want to widen the circle a little bit. Add a couple more chairs. There's chairs over in that direction. Yeah. Everybody, come into the circle. And for those of you who just joined us, we uh, just finished introducing ourselves. So once you sit down, if you could introduce yourself, and uh, just your name and the name of your organization. Tammy Dixon, Rigolage Production. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And again, thank you all for being here. Um, well. The first thing we want to say is that this is a totally uh, safe space. We want you to feel free to say whatever you want. We, we recognize that sometimes around issues with disability, there's a lot of fear about saying the wrong thing. And so we want to encourage you to just be as inappropriate as you 
<laughs> need to be in order to get your point across. Because we're not the language police. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna write it down and stalk you afterwards. <laughs> so, so we really feel like in order to have real conversations where we get down to the nitty gritty of what we want to talk about, the only way we can do that is to, you know, give everybody in the room, including ourselves, permission to you know, say potentially the wrong thing, but we're saying for purposes in our space, there is no wrong thing. So feel free to say what you want. And one of the resources that we hope that um, you'll be able to come away with is, um, the, I think your, your hand out there is a, a language sheet um, that helps with when you don't really know what the right words are and you're in a, in a situation where you want to use correct language, this is a good, a good step so that you have vocabulary so that, that you don't end up just not having conversations. Um, and we're just, we're so glad that you're all here, um, regardless of disability or non-disability. And it's, it's very useful for these conversations to really have everyone in the room um, and for us all to be able to advocate for um, yeah, we're we're definitely we're definitely uh, encouraging our allies to speak up. Don't feel you know if you don't identify as a person with a disability. We're just as happy to have you as if you do. So we can out. We need all the allies we can get. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think I, we were going to start with sort of talking about what brought you here today, but there's so many of us and so little time. That I think I think we're just gonna play a little bit of an icebreaker game with you guys right now, and we don't have a whiteboard or anything, so we can't write these down. So if somebody wants to write some of these things down, or has a really great memory, that's cool. <laughs> but we're just gonna spend a couple of minutes, and we we have quickly termed this little game disability dump for no other reason than that's what we termed it last night. <laughs> So, so when you when you hear the word disability, we say disability. Just throw out for us some some things you think about, some terms, some assumptions. And again, please don't worry about being inappropriate or or anything. Indeed, we're popcorning. We're not calling yes, on you to shout you. it out. Yes. I'm gonna try and talk it out. Oh, oh, excuse me. Do it. Do it. Yes, let's go for it. Catherine is agreed to. I'll write it down. So you're the Catherine's got uh, sleep. Off. Uh, I'm the playwright. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? Creativity. Just throw it out. We got creativity. Empathy. What? Say it again. Empathy. 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 Access. Autism. Okay. Invisibility. Okay. Perspective. Purple. Yeah, really. Kim. Financial issues. Courage. Struggle. Handicap. Pity. Communication. Inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Brave. Sensory sen sensitivity. Possibilities. Genius. <laughs> Special. Uh, crazy. Person. Misunderstood. Courageous. Innovative. Anybody Scared. else? Huh? Scared. Yes. yes. Awesome. Both spelling. around fragility, that I might further hurt someone. Okay, yes, that's a really good point too, and I think that sometimes that with uh, the disability community, there's a little bit more of that particular, um, not trying to hurt someone because of the fragility with other communities where we have affinity groups, because part of 
of the, the unconscious bias that we sometimes face is that we are very fragile. Right. Yeah. Although, I'm willing to go ahead. We're not all always fragile. Yeah. We have one little area that, you know, that is, has always been in this perception. I had friends call me a, a little baby bird. And I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an eagle, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can kick your ass. <laughs> you know, as a person who's coming from an intersectional place, I find that there are really there are similarities to how the conversation plays out when it comes around conversations about inclusion around race. You know, people are like black. You know, they don't want to say the word. Um, or a conversation about intersectionality around um, <coughs> uh, uh, gender or sexuality. Um, people don't want to say the wrong thing because they don't want to get themselves in trouble and they're afraid that they're holding on to, no, they're not afraid, they know that they're holding on to some larger societal assumptions that are wrong and they just don't want to get yelled at. Yeah. I respect that. You had something to tell me. No, I think sometimes, uh, you know, we're, we're moved to try to use careful language because we're trying to train the bigger community that we hear saying offensive language and then we get into a circle like this and we're free up to have a, a more honest conversation. Mm. Yeah. I think fear is a huge part of it. I, I totally agree. I think, I think fear is a huge part of it. But I think it's fear. I mean, I think it's fear of saying the wrong thing, but I also think that there's a fear of, of people with disabilities. I mean, I think disability is, is a fearful thing for some people. Yeah, that's um, right. Because I, you know, I think that we, not only do we not know what to say, but, you know, I think it's also a fear of this could be me, and I don't really want this to be me, and I, you know, this might be me, or it will be, you know, I mean, the, the chances of it will be all of us is probably 100%. Yes. So, yeah, the, lucky so the, lucky the, lucky the longer we live, with the more medical advances we have, look, all of us, and, and let's just say, and, you know, and you probably all know this, but it might not be something that you've thought about, but disability, every single person in this room, I don't care what your ethnicity is, I don't care what your race is, I don't care what your orientation is, I don't care what your gender ID is, what your religious status is, what your economic status is, every single person in the room, you can join our club at any moment. <laughs> well, so. and honestly, we're one of the largest communities in the United States, because if you, at some point in your life, you're going to be disabled, right? You have been or will be. And you are related to someone who has or will be. It's not a minority community. I sometimes get confused when we talk about you know making accommodations. I'm like, why don't we just build things so that they're accessible? Because we're all gonna need that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say uh, ignorance. Yeah, not really wanting to know. Yeah. Not really knowing what's happening or what the issue is. And is it bigger than just the visual thing that I'm seeing? You know, is there is you know, just the trepidation of, you know, sure. Sure. Well, that's knowing how to handle or deal or, you know, if I even sure. have to do it. Today. You know, well, then we were, we were having a conversation yeah. yesterday just about what people are, what, what it's okay to say to a person and mm -hmm. how much you can actually cross that line of asking questions mm -hmm. to a potential stranger. Um, and what people feel very comfortable about saying, I, I will always have people walking with a cane, I'll have people ask me, what's wrong, so what's wrong with your leg? Making the assumption from their end that probably that I stubbed my toe or I twisted my knee or something a little bit more acceptable than probably what the actual situation is. But the idea that somebody has the ability to <coughs> ask me a personal question like that is always kind of mind blowing to me about that, that it's, it's a personal question that I don't think that they would necessarily ask other personal questions mm -hmm. to somebody like that, but somehow they're given that permission to themselves to ask that because yeah. I think of what they think the outcome is, which is not necessarily the case. Hello, uh, I just met you. Would you please tell right. me intimate details yeah. about your body? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's like I'm being helpful because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Right. I'm interested in you. Right. And then after the four of us had that conversation last night at the party, literally the last conversation I had with someone before we walked out the door was someone, was someone coming up to me being like, so what, what, why, why do you walk with the cane? Like, oh, I, I need it because I have a disability. What kind of disability? Like, what specifically is wrong with you? <laughs> are we, are we, are we that level? We're like knowing each other? Like, we met before. This is like our second conversation. Like, oh, I remember good to see you again. But really, like, what is, what is wrong with you? Now I know who you are, what you 
what's going on. I yeah. put you in that box. I feel safer, but if the lines are blurred, I think yeah. you get nervous. I, I think yeah, but too, but I think we're, we're a, a curious nation, um, and I don't think we have a lot of, in, in our culture, a lot of barriers to just saying what we think. Right. I don't think it's the same in, in other countries, uh, to be honest. Um, and I think it's our way of making friends too. Yeah. It's like, let's find a common, okay, I, I, I love your necklace, or yeah. hey, why are you using a cane? So um, sometimes I don't think it's necessarily about the disability, but maybe I'm being generous. No, I, th I think that's a very good, I think that's a great point. But I, but I think it also leads us, and we're, we're, we're actually getting ahead of ourselves because you guys are asking great questions. We want to make sure that we, that we take time for, for um, some of the language stuff. But I think that what happens with disability is people don't see it as a community or a culture as they do uh, a race or ethnicity or even sort of religious, you know, of gender identification or, or sexual identity or people don't see it so they feel okay to ask about it it's like i wouldn't say to you so what's up with your what's up with your race there you know tell me tell me about the characteristics there that you know that i'm that i'm seeing in your face you're a really handsome guy can you, can you tell me you know where you come from and you say, oh, I come from New Jersey. No, but really, where do you, where do you really come from? That's, that's a conversation people that people do, have. People do yeah. ask that question, right? What people do ask that question, what are you? Well, but in some sense, with disability, it's, we haven't gotten to the point, like there are people who's, who will say, what are you, right? But by and large, we, we've, kind of, we've kind of moved past that with, with some of the other, um, underrepresented groups. I don't like to use the word ma marginalized, so I'm going to use the term underrepresented in for our industry. Um, we've, been, we've been thinking about, um, there are just some, like, a couple of really, like, helpful statistics, and Claudia alluded to that, that um, there are between 56 and 58 million of us in this country. And, and that's all kinds of disabilities. That makes us America's largest minority, 20%. So that's 20% of our population identifies as having a disability. And now, that's just the people that identify or can be identified as having a disability. So it's probably larger than that, right? So that's a huge number. So what does that mean for our industry necessarily? What does that mean for the bottom line? So are we targeting audiences with disabilities? Are we thinking about our programming in ways to bring people with disabilities into our spaces, into our theaters? Are we thinking about the stories we're telling? If we are telling stories about disability, are we telling them authentically by using actors with disabilities? Are we doing those things? Uh, you know, some are, some aren't, and but we all can be doing a better job in every area of underrepresented groups, but particularly with respect to disability. Just a little factoid that, that's kind of an eye opener. In the 2013 to 2014 uh, Broadway season, there were seven plays on Broadway that had a character with a disability as a major character in the play. Not one of them was played by an actor with a disability, uh, either as the actor who was cast or understudies. Not one. Seven of them. Seven fairly well-known plays. None of them new plays except, I think, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Times. All great plays. Not even people, uh, characters, actors with disabilities not considered for any of those roles. So that just shows you like where we are in the disconnect with our thinking. And you guys, you know, so astutely outlined some of the reasons why. One of the biggest ones I think is fear. You know? So And, I, and Christine, that's not even thinking about casting actors with disabilities and roles that don't necessarily that, say. Yeah. We, haven't, we haven't even gotten yeah. there yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like Marshall. Um, you know, I'm kind of struck by the seven plays. Um, but there are a lot of regional theaters here, so maybe um, we can take an opportunity to, 
state that, you know, if, if any regionals are intended on doing those productions, they will honor the authenticity um, of those roles. Absolutely. Um, the mayor, I really fast. Is there anybody here from Mixed Blood Theater? All right, so Mixed Blood is doing yeah. something fabulous. I freaking love it. Now, of course, they were like, okay, we want to support artists with disabilities. We're going to, you know, we're going to have the rubber hit the road, so to speak. So they started off trying to make a list, a database of scripts that um, highlight or focus on disability. What they discovered was that was a crazy project that did not work. Why? Because um, so many plays have a main character or a main plot point that deals with disability. So they realized, oh, we need to take a slightly different tack. So they sourced a list of plays, and they have a grant project where theater companies can apply to do one of these plays, and if they promise to produce that play with actors who actually come from the disability community that the play is talking with and about, um, that group gets $5,000 to help do that play. Now, I hope I am representing that program accurately. You are, but it's, oh. only, it's only three. It's only three? Mm -hmm. Only three companies? Yeah. There's a lot of plays on that list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say I was one of the people that came to, to contribute to the list. And they only had money to give $5,000 to three theater companies. So if you're, it's percolating, hurry up. <laughs> uh, and, and, also, and also understand that, that content kind of has a like, direct connection on audiences. You know, everything is, everything, nothing is kind of separated out. Everything kind of relates to each other. They just came from the audience revolution yeah. section. And they talked about that, you know, that people want to see themselves reflected on stage, and that's a great part of developing new audiences. And so people with disabilities also want to see that. And then, and so the point too is you want to get, you know, kids with disabilities to have an idea of going into the theater when they're older so they can see themselves on stage. If they see representations of themselves, realistic representation of themselves, they have an interest in going to the theater. So everything, every segment of theater, whether it's, you know, on stage, off stage, backstage, kind of reflects and kind of impacts the, the other part. And I, did I mention the, the economic? No, I don't think I said it. Income. I don't think I said it, which I always do. It's one of the first things I go to because you know it's all about the bottom line. Now, no, did I say that? I <laughs> <laughs> so, so just so you guys know, uh, people with disabilities have two hundred and twenty billion dollars of discretionary income to spend. So, like, we're a target audience, you know, and. And I think that figure is probably even larger now. That I think that I think that stat is about five years old. I think it's from 2010. So think about that. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money that theaters are just kind of letting go into the vapor. You know. Yes. I have, a, I have a question about that in particular. So so one of the things that we look at is yes, we want uh, we want. Uh, People, individuals with disability, to uh, feel welcome in our audiences. We, you know, we try to make this as accessible as possible with different programs. Um, however, we give a lot of inventory away for free, and so the idea is, you know, you, you look kind of at these models and there's some discount pricing and all of that. And I'm really interested in people's feedback about what, what, what's the equity in pricing? Is there, is there a reason that we should have discounts or should be giving a certain amount away, or, or what can we? Expect we, as uh, having to support all of our, you know, our own organizations and the bottom line. I have a thought on that. Um, I think that it depends. As, as we're talking about intersectionality, there are a lot of people with disabilities who come from uh, underserved areas, and I would, I would think that that would be that there would be more factors rather than a big beyond a mobility issue, for example, that would go into uh, that that slide pricing. Because I mean, a lot of people with disabilities are, you know, re recently retired bajillionaires and there's no reason that they wouldn't be willing to, and, and delighted to pay a full price for an accessible seat. I think sometimes you have to look at sections like you would look, look at every other section. You're going to have people that have money to, to, to spend and then you're going to have people within that community that don't have money. Right. So it's, it, it varies. And I also think that um, with disability and, and another, and I hate to throw out all the stats to you guys, but like if the national average of people who are unemployed <coughs> is 21%, which it is, so 21% of our population is unemployed, and this is the non-disabled population, 
is unemployed at any given time, right? That doesn't, whether it's part-time, full-time, it's, you know, it's just 21%. With people with disabilities, it's 71% of people with disabilities at any given time are unemployed or underemployed. So that, so that sort of speaks to your question about, you know, discounts and strata pricing, and I think it just, it, it just depends. Now we had a question over here on the yep, question over question here that we should probably move to the next section. Yep. Um, I, oh, I hope you're, oh. Shall I go? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think one of the challenges um, in talking about disability arts um, activities, I'm from Toronto, we have a 2025 full, in Ontario, full accessibility for all employees and, and all businesses. Um, and the challenge is this huge financial fear on the part of struggling theater companies to make the physical changes to the space that are required because so many are in 100 year old theater spaces, adaptive reuse, backstage, let alone dressing rooms is up seven flights of stairs and narrow and dark and so there's I think um, I, apropos of nothing apparently except money it becomes like a really interesting discussion to try and have and to facilitate when government has legislated but there's actually no funding to make the capital changes yeah. and investments and so there's a fear on the part of theaters of the capital required to do what they already know they should be doing in addition to the four wheelchair seats Well, I, I, I just have a very interesting <coughs> conversation about artists, actors, performers who are disabled that, uh, you know, in terms of um, companies wanting to access those actors, performers and artists, or <coughs> vice versa uh, in terms of training. Like, what, what are, what are the, the barriers in, in, in terms of that? That's a, like a behemoth of a question. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Totally. No. I mean, I'll 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 try to, and then you guys, you know, uh, one of the things that the organization that I work for do, does is maintains a database of disabled actors from around the country. So anybody who is considering hiring a disabled actor, uh, you know, call me. I have cards here, so please. Um, see me and I'll give you a card or I'll put them on the table and you can take them. So there's that. I mean, we are out there and there's other resources, but, but I can help you find resources that you need in order to, uh, to, in order to find actors with disabilities. And I don't mean, I, I think sometimes there's a presumption that when we're talking about actors with disabilities, we're talking about art, art as therapy or, or community theater. Yes. We're not, we're talking about professional like trained yeah. artists with, you know, in a lot of cases with degrees, with advanced degrees. I have an MFA in acting and directing. So, I mean, we're, we're out there. So, it's, 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 what we're really trying to do today, I think, is sort of change the perception and help you guys feel like you can more easily navigate um, the landscape and not being afraid to, to reach out in a way to communities with disabilities to bring them into your theaters to see stuff and to reach out to the disabled uh, artist community to start to put stuff on your stages that is authentic. And I think that's part, that's a big part of the conversation because it's, it's, it's making assumptions about what you think you have to do or what you should be doing before you include the people with disabilities in the mix. And I think that, and I think that for a lot of the parts is that there's, that that kind of like puts a stop on going forward and hiring somebody because you think, oh, well, I can't do this because of this, 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 that's already in place. When probably, you know, I mean, you said this yesterday, I mean, you know, after performers with disabilities want to work. Just so, like any. Just like anybody. So it's, it's not so much that, you know, try to talk, you know, have a discussion first before you kind of like put the kibosh on things and say, well, we can't do it because that you know, there might be a step, or there might be a this, or there might be a thing, or I make this assumption, talk to the person. Yeah, don't if people want to work. And so what, what you can actually do, and do, and you know, people can be creative. We can be probably, you know, they put in a lot of creative ideas, 
about what might work before you know you, you stop it. In and logistics ahead. and in yes. rehearsal. Yeah, so there's, there's, a, yeah. there's like a double win there, right? Because the idea of making an accessible casting choice or an inclusive casting choice means sometimes that you are, in an exciting way, rethinking your design elements. It means in an exciting way you're rethinking who's in the rehearsal room, what that rehearsal room is literally shaped like, looks like, all of those things. And so the creativity that you get from the logistics of, I have an inaccessible theater, but I have an actor who needs X, Y, or Z accommodation. There's the logistic creativity, which the disability community deals with all the time, and then there's the artistic creativity that you, it's kind of the extra little gift that you get <laughs> um, in the room with you as well. Yeah, no. we, and the, I just want to acknowledge this woman over here. Yeah, she's exactly. up here like, for like 20 minutes. Thank you. Yes. Um, Um, and uh, you know requirements uh, or provisions that are associated with that as it relates to um, nonprofit theaters. Mm -hmm. um, oh. You talking about ADA specifics? It's, I don't think any well, of us are. Well, I, 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 I don't, I'm not going to actually. I don't think we have time to go into specifics, yeah. but I am going to say something in general, which is you should be going beyond the bare minimum. You should be going beyond what is asked for by the ADA. Now the thing is, when you are designing, when you are like, when you buy that new carpet, are you thinking, oh, are we making design choices in that carpet that will help people with low visual? Are you, are you thinking about that when you buy the new carpet, when you're making small changes? Because it's not just about when you're buying the new building or building a building from scratch. Sometimes it's about, oh, when you're buying the new couch, are you thinking about it? Are you consulting with your community? Does your theater have an access committee that's made up of staff members and audience members so that you're making sure you're really just fully thinking about these things? Um, you know, the NEA has a really great uh, 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 you know, disability uh, section, and there are tools, there are people who give you advice and to help you, but my advice is go beyond the bare minimum. Totally. Um, I do want to make sure that we get to some of this language stuff, and especially the social model of disability, so I'm just going to hand it over to you guys. I think we're there. All right, cool. Um, you just want to, uh, let's start quickly by, we did something yesterday. You guys all have a, you guys all have a handout, right? So we're going to, we're going to ask you, we're going to ask for volunteers and we plead on page, let's see, what, what's on, what's their handout? Oh, okay. This is, this is, this is okay. So, uh, so on the first page, would somebody please read aloud the definition of uh, able body? It's down where it says definition is the first one. Able body should be avoided, although you will still hear it used. Accessible environments and adaptive equipment allow many individuals with disabilities to be able bodied. Preferred by the disability community, non disabled. Awesome. And we're going to go through all these, and then if there's questions, <coughs> we'll, we'll do that. Um, now the next one is, uh, oh, Crip Face or Disability Drag. Will someone read that, please? Mm. Anybody? The practice of using non-disabled actors to play disabled characters. Thank you. Crip Face. Crip Face. Uh, what does that come from? Well, you know how there's black face? Yeah, there's black, black face, face, yellow uh, face, 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 disability drag. <laughs> Let's read the next definition. Yeah, the next one is disability. Would someone read the definition of disability? As it's this definition of disability is a compilation of several resources which focuses on and promotes the concept of disability from the perspective of the social model rather than the traditional antiquated medical model which emphasizes impairments and limitations and puts the onus on disabled people to be fixed or adapt to societal barriers. Developed by disabled people, the social model regards disability as a socially constructed experience that identifies systemic barriers, negative attitudes, and exclusion by society, purposefully or inadvertently, as contributory factors in disabling people. The social model promotes the notion that while physical, sensory, intellectual, or psychological variations may cause individual functional limitation or impairments, these lead to disability only if society fails to take account of and include people regardless of their individual differences. 
The social model further recognizes disability as a community and a culture. That's a mouthful. Thank, Thank you. you for that. <laughs> Defined as a disability that is not immediately apparent and primarily neurological in nature. Examples include but are not limited to ADHD, learning disabilities, chronic pain, brain injury, anxiety disorders. Source disabled world right now. Deaf culture. Deaf culture describes the social beliefs, behaviors, art, literary traditions, history, values, and shared institutions of communities that are affected by deafness and which use sign languages as the main means of communication. Some people are born deaf, while others lose their hearing later in life because of illness or injury. People have, who have been deaf their whole lives are actively involved with the deaf community, consider deafness a difference in experience rather than a disability. Important note, big D deaf refers to a person who is culturally deaf and a member of the deaf community and uses American Sign Language, ASL. Little d, deaf, refers to a person who has a huge loss. Awesome. And, uh, and when we get to the end, I'd love to talk just a little bit about the creation of documents. Yep. Sure. And people first language. Putting the person before the disability and eliminating old, prejudicial, and potentially offensive descriptors, e.g. person with a disability not handicapped, physically challenged, or be disabled, uh, D-I-N. Important note, uh, as increasing numbers of disabled people view disability as an identity, a culture, and a community, people first language has fallen out of favor with many in the disability community. Preferred disabled person, disabled people. Thanks. And Claudia, do you want to yeah. <laughs> do you want to do, um, do, do neurodiversity and then talk about the all right, I didn't think to pull it up on here, so I will share that with you in a second. The creation of this document um, came about because we were, we were putting together um, our workshop to do with the Institute, TCG's Institute, and we realized that we um, didn't have shared language and we didn't have shared definitions. And going on Google was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> it was just full of <coughs> definitions that were hurtful um, to the specific communities that we were trying to address. So this document is a living document and it's pretty darn fresh, but it's been vetted with artists with disabilities. So I'm like, I'm doing a shout out to Mickey Rao, I'm doing a shout out to Howie Siegel, I'm doing a shout out to Julie Simon, I'm doing a shout out to Reagan Linton. There were others, it was a huge deep community. I know that you sent it to your people, you sent it to your people. So um, it is my hope that this document will continue to grow and be fed into. Um, the disability community is not homogenous. Um, so there are, of course, different perspectives within it. Um, but the, and the point of this is not to tell you this is the exact word to say. It's to give you a context. But of course, you should always ask the person you are talking with, what's their preferred noun? What's their preferred pronoun? What do they like to identify as and with? And, and even in the document itself, there's contradictions. I mean, I think we all recognize it. And I, and I think, as you said, it's, it's not a homogeneous community and there's going to be people that have different differing opinions about um, there's certain people that you know people first language is the way to go and so to kind of say it's not people first language for some people is is kind of it's going to make a lot of people need to rewrite their hand uh, right. and neurodiversity a movement in the autistic community to embrace our differences the neurodiversity community believes autism does not all does not need a cure and that a community benefits from having many neurotypes thinking in different ways. And we actually have a fresher um, definition of, uh, of spectrum in, in, in the updated version, which is autism spectrum disorder and autism are both general terms for a group of complex disorders of brain development. ASD is a de developmental disability that affects many parts of the brain, including difficulty understanding social interactions, sensory processing disorder, and affects the language communication centers of the brain, as well as obsessive special interests. While many people with other conditions may have some of these symptoms, a doctor only diagnoses ASD if all of these and other symptoms are present. ASD is a condition that's present from birth until death. Those with ASD excel in spatial, visual, and logical thinking. 
And I, I think we're probably going to run out of time to do this, but I just want to point you to page four of the document. It has a really um, handy dandy top ten table of commonly used terms, or I should say commonly used misused terms, uh, that you might find helpful in, as you go back to your companies. Um, <coughs> And, and their alternatives that are preferred by the disability community. And I'll just share the first one. How many of you, how many of you have heard or have used, and you don't have to raise your hand, you can call your own selves out privately, <laughs> have, used the, have used the term wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair, right? I know that most of you are going, oh yeah, I've seen that, or I've heard that, or I've said that, or I know somebody who said that. Um, if, something really helpful because language is not hard and fast and we recognize that it's changing all the time, right? Because our culture is evolving as we evolve. Um, something really helpful to think about in terms of language for particularly for the disability community is that most of the language that you will see to describe the disability community either in news or in literature or you know in our plays and our screenplays most of the language has been coined by non-disabled people, which is why you will see a term continually like wheelchair bound or suffers from or afflicted with, like I don't feel like I'm suffering right now. Some days I do suffer, but that's because I'm a human being. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily because I have cerebral palsy. So, so, if, so in your thinking, when you're just thinking about how to frame disability and how to talk about it, just check yourself before you open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think also going back to the definitions, um, the definition of disability that we put in there, um, it, it was a concerted effort to kind of introduce this idea of the social model of disability, just to kind of look at disability from a different lens and from a different framework. Because I think that, you know, in terms of the the community itself, that's been, it's morphed. I mean, it's, there's been a lot of different models of disability over the years. And basically going from medical to social has been the biggest jump or the biggest kind of like eye opener for a lot of people. And this idea of going from, you know, what you need to do with people just to just fix them and go to the doctor and once you're cured then everything, that's, a, that's the goal of, of the person with disability to this idea of, you know, disability is, that's part of an identity and it's part of, who you are, and basically it's society that disables people, because if society didn't put up all the barriers, you know, environmentally and all the attitudinally and all the other barriers that they did, then we really wouldn't have a disability. So it's, it's, it's just a different way of thinking. Which brings us into what we can all do to support each other in, in the world of theater, what resources you can all keep in mind. And the packet is really useful. Language is, is hugely important. Um, but to, to, to Beth's point, um, just being aware that people have different uh, ways of moving and different physical requirements is just so useful. I mean, among the affinity groups that, that are represented at TCG, um, we were having a little bit of a conversation last night that the, the disability group is the only one that you could sort of accidentally affront, <laughs> um, like in, in, in a really like, um, to really exclude. So like, so last night at the at the party, oh, yeah. <laughs> those stairs were for real. Yeah, we I was not having any hot dogs. Yeah, so we came in and we're and it's like you know stages one through nine the upstairs. These other things over here, hot dogs upstairs. Like okay, so we go over there. Like you, there's not another group that you would be able to do that with. Like if you put up a sign that said Norwegians aren't allowed upstairs, like you would have to think about that. Like no women upstairs, dudes yeah. only up there. Like yeah. that would be alarming. But it, but it's not until until people with mobility issues come in, you're like, oh, we forgot about those guys. Right. And uh, and yeah, no and, you know, everybody's very well meaning. So then you'll get you know the the lovely volunteers who say, oh, but what's up there? Oh, that you know, there's a couple of food things up there. But that's okay. There's like plenty of stuff down here for you to enjoy, yeah. you know, and, and like everyone is very well meaning, but you just, yeah. when you're thinking about it, it's, it's to expand on what Beth said really quickly and just encapsulate the difference between the social model and the medical model. 
I like to say because it's one sentence. In the medical model, the onus is on the person with a disability to adapt or to fix ourselves or to make ourselves better, right? With the social model, the onus is on society. So that's just like an easy way to think about, to, wrap your, to start to wrap your brain around it. I think that is incredibly empowering for the allies in this room. Because yep. if we think about disability in the medical model, then all you can do as an ally is feel bad for us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, all you can do is say, that's something that's different about you, that you're dealing with, that you're, you know, and pity is something that comes up in any kind of allyship, right? But it's, it's particularly salient, I think, in the disability community. But as allies, you could say, look, I, I don't know, I don't have the same experience that you do, but I can make sure that this space is accessible, I can make sure that this production is inclusive, and like I said before, there are actually like really hidden gifts of creativity that come when you make that commitment. So I'm really optimistic because I think there's a lot that can be mined from there. I also want to you know offer to all of us allies as well another shout out at Mixed Blood because they ha they've gone so far as to have a guiding a guiding committee of yep. this uh, disabled <laughs> folks who meet month. I was so surprised when I was working there. Like every month, they're there to make sure that the institution is including the voices because we. We don't know everything, we are ignorant, and we need to make sure everyone has a seat at the table.
transportation before. I was like, dude, these are the job requirements. Can you do them? Do you have workarounds to make this work? And then there were some things where I was like, oh, well, I can, I can do large type on this. Oh, well, I can get this kind of a thing because that'll be useful for the future uh, to make it more accessible for you. But I had a conversation and that was useful. So I do think you always apply. You never listen to somebody say no. You don't let somebody say no for you. Um, but, uh, but I think it's also up to the hirer to, to be thinking in a more accessible way. And also, yeah, um, just one quick thing that some of you may, and you probably know like in an administrative staff um, way that you are not allowed to ask someone in a job interview uh, if they have a disability, if, they, if it's obvious that they have a disability, what the nature of their disability is. That includes casting, folks, as well. Those of you who are, who are involved in casting at all, you cannot, cannot, cannot <laughs> ask an actor when they come in, so what's up with you? Why are you in the wheelchair? The thing that you can, and it happens all the time, so I know you're probably all like, oh, like, really? People ask that? They ha ask it all the time. But you can ask them, you can talk to them about being able to fulfill the actual requirements of the job. And that includes casting. Clearly, if the role is a ballerina, are you going to be able to walk on a tightrope? Can we, you know? So that you can do. Joel, you had a question. No, I didn't that. Oh, well, thank you guys. We are we are very much out of time, and this is just the beginning of a larger yes. conversation. Thank you so much.